All right, I'd like you to head towards your seats, please. And we'll, we'll get going with this um, slightly optimistic session. So uh, the ERC traditionally has been a spot where some of the uh, best science is presented. Uh, and I must admit I've never seen a, a session that we're about to see which has not only uh, four recently performed large uh, randomised controlled studies, effectively, in cardiac arrest, probably four of the best that you'll see, but also we have established uh, two panels, a panel for each of the, the sets of publications, um, where we'll get some experts with different uh, backgrounds to provide for you um, some comments about those particular papers. So the way it's going to work is um, there, there's two parts to this. The first one is the Paramedic 2 study and the second one is the Airway studies that are going to be grouped together. And I'm going to chair the Paramedic 2 uh, presentation and discussion and then I'll hand over to Jerry Nolan who'll chair the, the Airways uh, presentations and the Airway panel discussion. Um, unfortunately, there's probably not going to be time for a, a lot of uh, questions from the audience as there probably will be lots of potential questions but I do want you to tweet we'll have uh, Andy keeping an eye on the tweets but otherwise uh, we've only got 22 minutes for discussion after the paper's been presented so I'm going to try and get the, the individual members of the panel to, to come up with their thoughts and unfortunately they might be provocative alright so let's start off uh, with Gavin Perkins um, and the Paramedic 2 study. Welcome, Gavin. So thank you very much, uh, Peter, for that kind introduction. Uh, I'm uh, truly delighted to be able to do the first public presentation of the, the Paramedic 2 uh, trial that, as many of you will be aware, were published um, online back in July and in the print edition of, uh, of New England Journal uh, approximately three weeks ago. The trial was funded by the National Institute for uh, Health Research and there's a disclaimer here that uh, we're, we're required to uh, put forward with any presentations that we do with uh, research funded by the National Institute for, for Health Research. But we're incredibly grateful for their funding and also the support that enabled this trial to be possible. Uh, these are my conflicts of interest. They're uh, purely academic conflicts of interest. I have no commercial conflicts of interest. I want to start off by providing a little bit of background and context uh, around the uh, adrenaline trial. And, and it focuses really around the chain of survival, which is a concept uh, that was first developed about 50 years ago uh, and shows the sequence of actions that are needed in order to improve outcomes from cardiac arrest. And if you go back in time then actually early advanced life support and the use of pharmacological treatments uh, to improve return of spontaneous circulation formed the fourth link of the, the, the chain of survival. But the context for our trial was that although adrenaline has been used since the, the very inception of CPR, the evidence which informed the use of adrenaline uh, didn't stand up to the scrutiny that would be expected if someone were to be considering a, a therapy uh, in, in today's world. Uh, it had never been properly tested to see whether it was beneficial or harmful. Over the last decade, our confidence that we perhaps had with adrenaline started to be challenged. And I think this editorial from uh, uh, Bob Berg and, and, and Bobby Sutton, which describes uh, adrenaline or epinephrine, as the Americans call it, as a double-edged sword. And it's described as a double-edged sword on the basis that uh, consistently studies would demonstrate that it was able to improve return of spontaneous circulation. But in the series of systematic reviews that uh, informed the development of our trial protocol, there was inconsistent evidence and uncertainty about its effect on long-term survival, in particular long-term survival with a favourable neurological outcome, with a number of studies suggesting that whilst it may be good at restarting the heart, it may not be good for the brain. ILCOR called for a placebo-controlled trial uh, in 2010, and they called again in, in 2015, and, and that really served as the platform for us to start thinking about and designing the Paramedic 2 study. 
A study of this size and scale wouldn't be possible without the commitment and involvement of uh, the ambulance services, the Warwick Clinical Trials Unit and the many others through our national health system uh, and collaborators both in the UK uh, and internationally. I'd like to thank uh, all of those for their contribution, many of whom are, are here today. The idea of introducing a, a trial or conducting a trial that was essentially withdrawing a current treatment brought with it its own ethical challenges and, and we spent a long time thinking about this and planning prior to undertaking the study and we sought the views of patients and the public, doctors, nurses, we consulted a research ethics committee uh, who formally gave the approval for the study to go ahead and also worked with the Health Research Authority uh, to develop a framework that would enable the, uh, a study like this to be conducted. We conducted the trial, which was a clinical trial of investigated medicinal product uh, in compliance with the relevant legal and regulatory frameworks. We had broad support from our professional community uh, and we spent quite a long time talking to patients and members of the public and uh, at one of the meetings that had over 300 people uh, we presented the rationale for the trial and sought their views and the majority of people uh, thought that there was a need for the trial and, and would if they were unfortunate enough to sustain a cardiac arrest be willing to participate. We also asked them what was the most important outcome if they were to uh, sustain a cardiac arrest and survival with a favorable neurological outcome uh, was the one that they rated as most important. So that really provides the background and the context for the Paramedic 2 randomized control trial. The primary objective was to determine the clinical effectiveness of adrenaline in the treatment of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest with our primary outcome of 30-day survival. We chose 30-day survival and survival with a favorable neurological outcome as a secondary outcome on the basis that we had confidence that we would be able to track the survival estimate with a high degree of, of precision because of the administrative and database systems uh, that are available and both our research and previous research uh, had suggested that tracking patients certainly in the longer term if you want to track their neurological outcome that you can face loss to follow up uh, which was the rationale for us choosing survival as the primary outcome. We included patients that sustained an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest and received resuscitation by trial-trained paramedics. We excluded people that were pregnant, uh, aged less than 16 if they had asthma uh, or anaphylaxis or if they'd been given adrenaline uh, beforehand. I think this, this slide is here to remind us that uh, we were enrolling patients that were in refractory cardiac arrest. So in other words, were unresponsive to initial attempts at resuscitation because people will recall that the ERC guidelines say defer giving adrenaline till after the third shock. Uh, and for the non-shockable rhythms, uh, adrenaline is given after starting high quality uh, CPR and, and uh, simultaneously with achieving an airway. Randomization was achieved by opening uh, a, a pre-allocated pack and it had either adrenaline or placebo and it was not possible to identify uh, between them. The papers that they're available for people to uh, uh, look at the baseline characteristics of patients. I've not put them broken down by groups because they were well balanced but overall two thirds were male. The average age was 69. Uh, six out of 10 had bystander CPR. Half were bystander witness, 20% were in an initially shockable rhythm, and the majority sustained a cardiac arrest due to a cardiac cause. The medium time to adrenaline administration was 21 minutes, uh, and the average number of uh, syringes given was, uh, was five, equivalent to five milligrams of adrenaline in the intervention arm. This is the consult flow diagram, which walks you through the, uh, the, the flow of patients. And uh, I just draw to your attention, uh, again, this uh, point that we were recruiting patients that were refractory to initial uh, treatments. And so when we come to the survival rate, of course, it's going to be lower than the survival rate that you see if you consider all comers. And the, the flow diagram shows that we'd, we'd stripped out 615 patients who'd achieved return of spontaneous circulation before they were assessed for eligibility. Uh, we randomized in the end 816, or at least we opened 816 uh, uh, packs, and you can see here that there were a few post-randomization exclusions, so that was after the pack was opened, but before the, uh, the drug was given. We had approximately 4,000 patients in uh, each of the arms, and as we anticipated, we had nearly complete follow-up for our 30-day survival endpoint. 
So the first finding of the, the, the study was the return of spontaneous circulation, and we're not surprised to see that this was threefold greater uh, in patients receiving a, adrenaline. That was consistent with the observational data published uh, prior to that. Similarly, the rate of admission to hospital uh, was threefold higher, 23% uh, in the adrenaline arm uh, and 8% in the placebo arm. But when we track through the patient journey uh, and through to the survival point, there's been a substantial reduction in the number of patients that are still alive by the time you reach 30 days. But we did find a small, a 0.8% difference uh, in survival in the adrenaline group, and, and that result was statistically significant. By contrast, uh, we found uh, no statistical evidence of a difference in survival at discharge with a favorable neurological uh, outcome, 2.2% in the adrenaline arm uh, and 1.9% in the placebo arm. That's explained when you think, how can you uh, consider the paradox between increased survival but no increase in favorable neurological outcome? And the reason for that was that double the number of patients in the adrenaline arm uh, had severe brain damage and so therefore weren't categorized as, as surviving with a favorable neurological outcome. And this is just showing that as, the, uh, as a, a, a graphical uh, format. Uh, and I think show, showing the pattern, really, if, if, if you visualize that slide, that on the adrenaline side, the numbers are higher in those with moderate disability to severe uh, disability. In terms of tracking those patients forwards, uh, I think it's, uh, it's worth noting, and I think, unfortunately, this slide hasn't uh, uh, captured all of the information uh, uh, that was certainly on it at the time that I wrote the slide. Um, but but uh, the survival benefit was sustained to three months, uh, and the follow-up for favorable neurological outcome, as anticipated, uh, was limited by the number of patients that were lost to follow up and so um, there was a higher proportion with a poor neurological or sorry there were 16 with a poor neurological outcome in the adrenaline group uh, and 11 in, in the placebo uh, group but the, I think there were about 26 patients that were lost to, um, to follow up. I'm not going to, uh, to, to dwell on uh, this slide as I see that the chairman has, uh, has, has come up to the stage but it's to simply say uh, that the, um, there were no evidence of interactions for the various subgroups that we looked at. So in conclusion, uh, we found that adrenaline can restart the heart, uh, but we didn't find evidence that it was good for the, uh, the, the brain. And um, what I put to the panel and what I put to us as a, as a wider group now is, is to consider what the implications are for, for practice. And we, as a group of researchers, believe that uh, it should act as a stimulus for us to start conversations with our communities uh, that we serve to ask them in terms of the, uh, the outcomes and the values uh, that they consider important. Uh, I thank the chairman and I look forward to hearing the panel's comments. Uh, thank you, Gavin. Um, uh, and uh, thank you for your concise summary of a very complicated study, but such an important one. So we have a panel of 10 people, um, a lot with involvement uh, in the European Resuscitation Council, the study itself, um, and the International Liaison Committee. Um, I, I'm going to hand over to them now um, and allow them to perhaps in, a, in no particular order, but perhaps starting from this end, um, Jazz, um, who might have to get up close to a microphone. And I'll, I'll keep you to time. If you start talking too much, we'll just encourage the next person to so speak to get, over you. get the ball rolling, I'll congratulate Gavin and the Paramedic 2 team to putting together one of the biggest and best resuscitation trials done so far. And so well done to them all. In terms of what does it mean for clinical practice, I think we just need to wait, wait a bit and think about it and do a proper systematic review and also look at some of the supplementary data and I'm sure there'll be some secondary analyses and so on because clearly that outcome applies to the UK NHS where call to drug delivery time was 21 minutes and 
what would it be in a system where it's 10 minutes, five minutes? What would it be for in-hospital cardiac arrest where teams turn up in a few minutes? And the answer may be different for lots of different scenarios, and that's before you take into account values and preferences of patient groups and different cultures. I'll stop there. All right, thank you very much, Jazz. As uh, Task Force ALS Chair, uh, Vinay. So similar, <coughs> similarly, I think it's a, an amazing trial. Um, some of the points that I think we need to bring up were that the quality of CPR was not controlled uh, or accounted for fully. Uh, as, uh, as Jazz said, that the delivery of epinephrine was a median of 21 minutes, so occurred relatively late, and was given across the spectrum of um, etiologies and r initial rhythms. There was an excellent um, there was an excellent publication by Jerry Nolan and Chris Groff, Goff uh, in Critical Care 2018 that brought up many of these points in the context of all the previous studies that led up to this. A really excellent review of epinephrine and also suggested to me that perhaps these fixial arrest patients, given good quality CPR and early epinephrine would be perhaps a target population. So rather than for the implication rather than throwing the, uh, the baby out with the bathwater and getting rid of epinephrine altogether, it suggests to me really two things. One, we have to perhaps selectively be able to provide epinephrine in a timely manner to those patients that would respond. And secondarily, epinephrine did what it was designed to do. It's not a magic bullet. It improved coronary perfusion and heart resuscitation. We had more survivors and we're on the cusp of seeing an improved uh, neuro adjusted neurologic outcome at 30 days. But we didn't control for the hospital care, the post-cardiac arrest care. So I think a major element to consider in paramedic three would be combining selective uh, application of epinephrine with excellent post-cardiac arrest care. Uh, thank you, Vinay. Uh, Judith Finn. Yes, thank you. Um, I'd also like to congratulate Gavin because I do know how difficult these studies are to do. Being a co-author of one of, of the only other RCT, which was underpowered, but nonetheless did show similar trends in that there was certainly increased risk with adrenaline, there was a, ten, a trend towards survival to hospital discharge, and the only adverse neurological outcomes were in the adrenaline group. So this, uh, the param our study, the Jacobs et al. study, was certainly along the same lines. I think it's an essential study to have been done because it was, uh, adrenaline was being used for decades with very, very, very little evidence, basically a few dog studies. And, uh, you know, we really did need to have some um, good, good studies to show whether it works. For me, it showed quite definitively that survival to hospital discharge, sorry, survival is increased with the use of adrenaline. I don't think we need any further studies to ascertain that. You get ROSC, you get to hospital. The issue is then, what's it doing to the brain in the um, process? Some people still manage to get discharged from hospital without neurological deficit, and I think it is important to note that. Not everyone who was in the adrenaline arm had um, severe neurological outcomes. Um, so I think that uh, as being a researcher, it raises as many research questions as it uh, has answered. Um, we're not sure about the timing. Uh, we're not sure about the cardiac arrest is such a heterogeneous group of patients with so many different underlying causes. Um, as Vinay has alluded to, perhaps there's some uh, subgroups that benefit more. Maybe it'd be better to have it early. Maybe, you know, we need to limit the dose, not keep ramming in the one milligram um, at, you know, at internet infinitum. So I think it does raise a lot of questions. Um, I think there is a lot of patient values um, tied up with decisions around this, but unfortunately, the patients we're dealing with, we can't have a long drawn out discussion with them about what their priorities are. And so that uh, does present a problem. For some people, survival, even with moderate um, cognitive um, or neurological deficit is still a good outcome. 
And that's not for me, but I certainly know patients who, um, for them, just being alive would be important. So I think we need to value that patient values will vary. And I think it's um, still an unanswered question as to whether we should or shouldn't use adrenaline. Um, I don't think we've answered that question, but we're certainly moving it along. Thanks, Judith. Um, Jerry Nolan. A uh, form of censorship. Yeah, I'm the investigator on this, on this study, as, as Judith was actually, so um, I should declare that COI straight away. But I should also take the opportunity as a co-investigator on the trial to, to congratulate Gavin on his leadership for, for what is probably one of the most challenging studies that has been published in modern times. Uh, so that it was really a massive effort. What has it taught us? In our system in the United Kingdom, any marginal gain from adrenaline is ti it's tiny, it's marginal. So all the other um, factors involved in CPR, um, you know, recognizing cardiac arrest, high quality bystander CPR, early defibrillation, way outweigh any potential gain from adrenaline. Having said that, um, yes, there were statistically more survivors to discharge. There was no statistical difference in terms of neurological outcome, um, but it still numerically favored adrenaline. Yes, there were more neurologically severely injured patients in the adrenaline arm, but I think the one most important point that I want to make is that it's very important to look at the three-month discharge survival data. And the problem and the challenge we've got there is as you go further out to those longer term outcomes, we lose statistical power. But if you look at the numbers very carefully, there are definitely more numerically more high, you know, better quality neurological outcome in the adrenaline arm. And the reason for that, and what hasn't been said so far, is that many, many, sadly, many of the patients with severe neurological injury actually go on to die. Some of them actually improve, of course, but many die. And so a lot of those patients that end up with severe neurological injury don't survive to three months, certainly not to six months. So if you look at it in those terms, one might argue that there is an advantage to adrenaline. And there's a, there's a counter argument to that, I'll leave others to say that. But I, I think it's worth looking at it very, very closely indeed. Thanks. Thanks, Jerry. Trace. Yeah, so, um, yeah, thank you for stealing my point. Uh, <laughs> So everyone's uh, congratulating you, Gavin. I have to say, I, I, was, I felt pretty confident you were going to give us a straight answer, so I'm actually a little disappointed with you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, I think it is uh, what we don't know is, it, you know, are we, um, are we saving, are we really doing harm for the brain with the epinephrine, or is it just a more advanced stage of illness? Uh, and which other, which uh, either way, Will we develop strategies in the future that will, you know, we have reason to believe that our ICU care will improve with time. I mean, there might come new strategies. So it's, it's really difficult to say no to something that gets you halfway there. And I've also been looking at, you know, the, you hide it well in the supplemental materials, but you know, if you go in and look at the three month uh, neurological outcome, it looks like some of these patients are improving, and we know that they do. We know that some of these patients are going to improve at three months, six months. So it's, it's really, really tough to know what, what cost are we willing to bear in terms of neurological impairment for a few extra good survivors. Thanks, Trace. Uh, Bob Nimmer. So, um, again, I would like to congratulate Gavin and his team on doing what is a very difficult and important study. Uh, and, and it is the kind of design of a study that was feasible given our current practice. So it really is a study of current practice versus taking something away from current practice. But I would argue that our current practice is fundamentally flawed, and that's, to me, the biggest weakness of the way, or the biggest challenge in interpreting this study. Uh, to take the extreme example, it's very easy to prove that parachutes do not work if you wait till you hit to the ground to pull the ripcord. So if you're doing a therapy where you miss the therapeutic window, uh, then the ability to detect a therapeutic benefit uh, is gonna be very challenging. So you know, what we do now in our standard practice is basically give a random dose of epinephrine as soon as feasible uh, in patients regardless of their size, weight, or kind of cardiac arrest. 
and we don't monitor any response to therapy like we could potentially do with an art line and determine what the effective dose and the most benef beneficial therapeutic dose is. So I would suggest that moving forward, if we're going to do additional epinephrine studies, we need to build in physiologic monitoring to determine if we're giving the right dose, uh, whether it's too low or too high, and if you need to give more to see if you're getting the therapeutic benefit you need. The other thing I would add, though, is again, what people have said is, if you look at the last line of the last table, that 95% confidence interval for 30 days survival is 0.97 to 2.0. So anywhere from one to double, no change in survival to doubling survival, and the, and the odds ratio was 1.39, means a 39% chance of improving survival with good neurologic outcome uh, at, 30, at three months. Now, again, the problem is there's so few patients that made it out to that long to say whether that really is potential. If you did more patients, you would see that or not. But uh, I think it, it's, it's incorrect to interpret this, uh, that epinephrine is bad for the brain. I think epinephrine isn't enough when you give it too late and potentially in the wrong dose. But in a significant number of patients, and I think there were 19 more patients in the epinephrine group that survived with good neurologic function at three months. So. Uh, thank you. Uh, Robert. Um, Gavin, for uh, the uh, the trial in the UK, it, it certainly helps the pre-hospital evidence base. Um, you know, from from our point of view, looking on the outside, it really starts to give some evidence to our to our colleagues that we can actually say, is this um, is this something you should be doing? Is it not? The put in in, in times with the uh, quality of CPR, is it more effective to have? We know with early recognition it is going to be more effect effective. So. Putting it in context with that, we can actually start um, myth, myth bustings with some of our colleagues that this is excellent, this isn't excellent. So it just helps um, helps us to send out information to the uh, to the frontline crews. But also, I think it, it, it begin, it, the discussion starts to become wider around we get the frontline crews to to hospital, but then what happens within the care of the hospitals? But also around the health economics within the, the, within um, sort of the whole system and the survivability, you know, does there become a point where we have to look at what it actually costs the system rather than just um, the individual? Uh, John, from a... As the only non-technical, non-medical person sitting here on the stage, I, can I say that uh, I was involved in the project from a patient public point of view, and from my point of view, it was very good that we had an active voice during the whole of the trial. Um, before the trial started, you've heard from Gavin, 95% of 300 that we surveyed felt that um, long-term survival with good brain, brain function was important. Uh, I went with Gavin to the Ethics Committee at uh, the John Redcliffe Hospital in uh, Oxford, and from then on I was involved with the trial management group. But I did have a panel which I chaired of eight other members, people that had had out-of-hospital cardiac arrest and those who'd had relatives that had out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. Throughout, that panel was supportive. They made constructive comments with the uh, posters which we put in every area where the trial was operating. The bracelets, which weren't mentioned today for those that didn't wish to be involved in the study, they had an input to that. When the results came out, my panel felt that uh, what had been, uh, what had come out of the community survey had in fact um, been achieved. So throughout there was a patient public involvement and I think that's vital in any trial. I've thought that for many years and then on this particular trial, I think there was constructive and supportive support from the public and from patients. Patients, as I say, who had been involved or had had family involved. So I won't comment on the technical side, that's not my role, but it was important that the public had a chance to voice their opinion at every stage throughout the trial, and they were very vocal in doing that. But in that vocal uh, support that they gave, it was always in a constructive manner. Thanks, John. Can I, can I ask you one question? Just um, follow up, it's been alluded to, what, what would a consumer want? Uh, with regard to an, an outcome. Is it, is it okay to be just alive? No, um, it was very clear from my panel that what's in fact uh, Gavin put on the slide, the thought was long-term survival with good brain function was the important factor. 
and that was clear from my panel throughout that that was what they wanted. Okay, thank you. Uh, Bernd. Oops. Thank you very much, and thank you very much um, to Gavin and the whole team for this for this outstanding study. And I was really I was really attracted when I had the opportunity to read the publication. And uh, what is for for me coming from Germany, where we have a different system, a physician-stuffed EMS system. What attracted my attention at first was the very low survival rate in both groups, so 2.4% versus 3.2%, even if there were some return of spontaneous circulation before randomization, the overall outcome is really low, I would say. And it reminded me to a study that we did where we compared Bonn versus Birmingham some 10 or 12 years ago, where the German system had a four-fold increase in survival as compared to the UK system. So it is not a secret that I'm a fan of a physician-staffed EMS system. And um, I, was, I would also like to point out all our attention to the fact that we had in the Gavin study, we had 60% bystander resuscitation rate. And nevertheless, the outcome was so low. And that was, for me, totally disappointing. And I'm wondering why this is so. Um, and another data that has already been mentioned is epinephrine has been given 21 or more than 21 minutes after the call, which is really a long time. Um, if, if you know that in the, in the paper it, it says the EMS was at the patient after seven minutes, that means that it took 14 additional minutes to administer epinephrine, which is really long. And I have compared this to a big study we did some years ago in physician-stuffed EMS systems where the Troika trial, and in this trial, epinephrine was given after 14 minutes after the call, so much earlier. So I'm really th thinking and feeling that if such a drug that really can help the heart and the patient to survive would, would have been given much earlier, maybe the survival rate would have been much higher. So my concern is that it is probably not possible to transfer the conclusions drawn in UK from that study to other systems that have a totally different approach and maybe very much higher survival rates. Thank you very much. So, um, look, I, I would like to uh, round up this part of the section. I've been through the tweets. Andy, do you want to, are there any particular tweets you want to comment on? Uh, there's a microphone. We'll, we'll give you a microphone. Um, f and, and for the interim, the, the sort of summary, I think, sounds like there's a lot, a lot of interpretation still to come and a lot of external validity issues to be worked through, but a, a very stimulating and probably a trial which will never be repeated. With regards to the tweets, uh, there's a lot of love for this uh, trial. Uh, the people have been wanting to see this. Uh, they're appreciating seeing the results. Probably the one big question is, how will it change the guidelines? Okay, well that's uh, across to um, the ILCOR group, and I guess in particular the ALS uh, task force. <coughs> but I won't ask Jazz to answer that because um, we'll need a bit of time to work our way through that. Unless you want to say something, Jazz? You want to talk about what the plan will be now? All right, <laughs> wait and see. All right, I'd like to thank all people involved with the session. It's been a, a great session. Thank you. So it's a pleasure to chair the second half of this session. Um, but I'll probably ask all the panel members to sit to sit back down in the auditorium because I'll get you to come up afterwards. Um, because we now have three presentations of, I think, really important randomized control trials concerning airway management in cardiac arrest. And we've been very much looking forward to these studies for some time. 
Um, it's great that we've got either the lead or major investigators of all of these trials here today to present you. Without further ado, it's a great pleasure to um, ask Jonathan Benger to come to the podium. And Jonathan was the lead, investigator, the lead investigator for the Airways 2 trial. Jonathan is an emergency physician from the UK. JB. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, thank you, colleagues. And thank you for the invite to uh, Bologna. It's a fantastic and beautiful city. Thank you. Um, I'm going to talk about um, Airways 2. This is a very complicated trial. Um, and so I'll have to spend some time on the methodology and the results, and there won't be much time for anything else. The no trial uh, can be done in isolation, no man is an island, and uh, whilst I get to stand here, I represent a very large um, and very skilled team uh, that stand behind me and with me to deliver this study. I just briefly want to mention the four ambulance services in England that supported the study. They serve 21 million people and managed to find time to support that study. So that's East Midlands, East of England, Yorkshire, and particularly South West, which is our lead ambulance service. And my many colleagues, uh, partner organizations, are universities involved, particularly the Clinical Trials Unit at Bristol University and the University of West, the West of England, which is where I am based. Uh, the uh, trial was funded by the National Institute for Health Research in England. Um, in terms of conflict of interest, I have no conflict of interest because I'm absolutely confident this is the most interesting trial that you will see today. Um, and I'm not, not in any way conflicted about that. I'm really very, very, very sure. Uh, I also have no conflicts of interest and we certainly made sure there was no industrial industry involvement in this study. Um, I haven't got time to tell you much about the background because I've got only 10 minutes to tell you about the trial. And to understand the results, you need to understand the trial, and it's not straightforward. Um, the bottom line is that, as we've already heard, the majority, vast majority of patients die before hospital discharge in the United Kingdom. Uh, nobody knows what to do about the airway. Uh, the observational data that has been collected to date uh, very strongly favors basic airway management, but it's likely to be heavily confounded by uh, indication. Um, and there are no uh, high quality, large scale randomized trials um, until the trials that you're about to see in this session. Uh, just a lot of non randomized uh, opinion. And so, like Gavin, this is the first public presentation of our paper in Airways 2 since it was published in JAMA in, on the 28th of August. Uh, and it's a pleasure to uh, go through the results with you today. As you know, this is a trial of the tracheal tube versus a supraglottic airway device, that's the eye gel. The, uh, Overall aim was to estimate the difference uh, in the primary outcome of modified ranking scale uh, score, either a hospital discharge or 28 days, whichever happened sooner. And we chose an MRS score of 0 to 3 because this reflects uh, good quality neurological function and functional outcome in, in survivors. So it's not straight survival, it's what you might call good quality survival. And as we've already heard, that's the outcome of interest to patients and public, certainly in, in our study, our patient and public group are very clear about that. And then a whole range of secondary outcomes, which I'll come on to. So this is a randomized trial, but it's very difficult to randomize between two airway devices at the point of cardiac arrest. And to do so is ethically challenging and logistically very problematic. And so we randomized in a cluster fashion, we randomized paramedics. Um, and there are pros and cons to, r to randomizing paramedics, uh, which I will touch on. The population is the big population in adult, uh, non-traumatic, out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. They were attended by a participating paramedic. Resuscitation was commenced or continued by the ambulance service. So this is a pretty representative population. The two treatments are tracheal intubation and the comparator, which is, say, a supraglottic airway device. Um, on, the, on the remaining slides, we'll put tracheal intubation on the left-hand side of the slide, That's, and then we'll put the supraglottic airway on the right-hand side of the slide throughout. The paramedics were randomized one-to-one. -one. We stratified them by the distance to hospital and their experience. Um, and we randomized 1,523 paramedics. So that's 1,523 clusters. Small clusters have statistical advantages because they uh, it reduces the level of intra-class correlation, which is advantageous. Um, and between them, those paramedics uh, enrolled 9,296 patients. So this is the largest study of its kind ever done. Um, now, it's important to realize that because we randomized paramedics and trained them, uh, they knew which arm they were in. They knew which treatment they were going to give. 
and that's really, really important, and it governs a lot of what we did in the trial. Because if the paramedics can then select whether a patient enters the study or not, there is a risk of bias, because they know what the, what the problem is, they know what they are going to do, and uh, if they can then select whether a patient is in or out on the basis of, for example, their perceived likelihood of survival, then you have a problem. And so when the paramedics are unblinded, you have to make extremely strenuous efforts to ensure that you recruit every single eligible patient. And that meant enrolling patients that the paramedics didn't even realize were eligible. And in fact, it meant enrolling every single patient that was potentially eligible for this trial in order to make the primary outcome analysis valid. And we did that, but it was very difficult. Everybody else pretty much in the study was blinded. Uh, recruitment went to plan broadly. This graph does not really quite do justice to 48 months of pain and misery, uh, but uh, the summary, when it's all over, is it all went very well. It's not quite as simple as that. Those of you who know trials know about that. So let me just take you through some of the things that happen when you randomize by cluster. So we sought volunteer paramedics. We didn't make paramedics do this. We sought volunteers, and clearly if paramedics volunteered to participate in a research study, you could argue they might not be wholly representative of those who do not uh, volunteer to take part in a research study. There is some evidence of that from our data, in fact. Um, of those who expressed an interest, we, we trained and randomized 1,523. Most paramedics who expressed an interest just didn't make it through to training because they had other commitments. Um, and then those paramedics uh, attended um, 12,000 700 in the trachea intubation and 13 and a half thousand patients uh, of kind of eligible uh, patients who had, who had, uh, had a cardiac arrest. And you'll see that those two groups of patients aren't, aren't balanced, and that's because we had a relatively smaller number in amongst those 1,500 paramedics, so quite high recruiting paramedics, and they unfortunately weren't entirely evenly distributed by chance, because when you get down to small numbers and you randomize, uh, you sometimes get chance imbalance. We had chance imbalance in high recruiting paramedics, and that led to an imbalance in total patient numbers. We couldn't have stratified for that because we couldn't predict who was going to be the high recruiting paramedic before the study started. We then removed all the patients who didn't have a resuscitation attempt, and you can see that there are very similar numbers. There are reasons for this. So we collected the reason for non-resuscitation according to standard JR count, that's UK guidelines, and we have complete data for all the patients that were not resuscitated. Um, and that left us with 6,500 or 7,000 patients assessed for eligibility. And again, the number that were ineligible uh, was very similar between the two groups and very well balanced across all of our exclusion criteria. I haven't got time to show you the details, but you can take my word for it that we excluded uh, patients in a very even way across the two groups. So what that meant was that the uh, 4,400 in the tracheal intubation and 4,800 in the supraglottic airway device group were really every single eligible paramedic, sorry, apologies, every single patient uh, that was in, uh, attended by a paramedic in our study. Uh, and that's the group that we are confident uh, gives us the most reliable answer because that includes every single eligible patient. And the work that our research paramedics in particular did to identify every single eligible cardiac arrest patient and ensure they were included in the analysis was extensive uh, and absolutely essential to the study. So we ended up with a range of, uh, well, f a median of five or six uh, patients per paramedic. Uh, with interquartile ranges of 3 to 9 or 3 to 10, and a total range, as you can see, between 1 and 48 or 1 and 56 patients attended. So some other paramedics were seeing a lot of patients in cardiac arrest. Um, and very importantly is the next bit down. So we gave the paramedics the opportunity to, uh, if they felt that it was in the patient's best interest to have an alternative approach to airway management, that they should do that. It would be unethical to say to a paramedic, you must undertake an airway intervention in a patient if you think they have no chance of that benefiting them or the intervention has no chance of success. And so what that meant, in effect, was that paramedics could choose to not use advanced airway management and they could choose the alternative. So if they were randomized to tracheal intubation, they could, for clinical reasons, choose to use an eye gel or vice versa. And one of the immediate things that you see in the study is that the effect of that uh, is that more patients had an advanced airway management attempt uh, in the uh, supraglottic airway device than the tracheal intubation arm. Not surprising, really. 
The truth is, is that you would expect that to happen. Superglottic airway devices are easy to put in. They can be put in, in when patients are in awkward and inaccessible positions. Tracheal intubation requires two practitioners and a patient and a practitioner in the right place. So it's not surprising that that happened. We had almost complete primary outcome data. We lost seven patients, three in one arm and four in the other. Um, in terms of the baseline characteristics, broadly age, uh, gender the same as you'd expect. Uh, the um, uh, time to arrival of the first paramedic, time to the arrival of the treating paramedic, uh, rhythms, et cetera, et cetera, all extremely similar. These are very well balanced groups as you would expect. Uh, similarly, uh, whether they're witnessed or not, whether they res the patient received resuscitation by bystanders, uh, even down to community level defibrillation was very well balanced between the two groups. And the headline result is this, uh, is that if you take all patients and you do an analysis of all patients, there is no difference. Now it's worth saying that what we're testing here is a strategy, um, and Henry who will talk next is very, made this very clear in some of his work is that we are, we're, the strategy is that we're saying to paramedics, we want you to, the first advanced airway technique we want you to use is intubation, but we accept that they might, uh, they might do something different uh, on clinical grounds, um, and so it's more complicated than just that alone. That's the uh, overall forest plot for the, for the primary analysis, as you can see, no difference. In terms of secondary analyses, we found that the superglottic airway was, was, was more likely to be successful in achieving ventilation up to two attempts, and the tracheal tube was less likely to be lost once the airway had been secured, both statistically significant. We found no overall difference in regurgitation and aspiration between the two groups, which was a surprise, um, and uh, refutes some previous concerns about superglottic airway devices. There is some subtlety in here, in that uh, regurgitation uh, before intubation was more common uh, and less common afterwards and the reverse for the eye gel. But the overall headline is that there was no difference and the actual differences that in that table are very small. The, we pre-specified a sensitivity analysis because we realized that not all the patients would get advanced airway and so from the outset we always said we'd analyze the patients who received advanced airway management, excluding those who didn't get that far because uh, they got better with basic airway management. And just looking at those patients who had advanced airway management alone shows a clear advantage in our primary outcome, a statistically significant uh, advantage for the superglottic airway device, which looks like that. Uh, and there's no doubt in, in this sensitivity analysis, the eye gel is better. However, it's important to bear in mind that that's a selected population. And so, in effect, Paramedics had the opportunity to select which patients received advanced airway management based on their allocation, and it may be that there is an element of bias in that particular analysis. This, oops, excuse me, uh, this chart broadly shows you two important things. The first is that those who received no advanced airway management do much better. Not surprisingly, they get better quick, quickly, respond to early defibrillation, they never need advanced airway management. And they're very similar outcomes, but slightly better in tracheal intubation, and they're a bigger group. There's a reluctance to use the tube. Once you're down in this part of the graph down here, and the advanced airway management is being delivered, uh, then there are clear advantages for the superglottic airway device. But it's difficult to be sure that this, there is an element of selection. The demographics and arrest characteristics for these groups at the bottom of the graph, who receive advanced airway management in the two groups, are very, very similar. They seem to be the same population, at least in that respect, but we can't be sure there's not some bias in there. So the upshot of that is that I've heard this trial already uh, des described as a Rorschach ink blot plot for paramedics, which means that you can look at the blot and you can see in it whatever you wish to see. And that's why interpretation is so difficult. I'd remind you that the strategy overall has the same outcome. More ventilation success with the superglottic airway device, no difference in regurgitation and aspiration. For the patients who actually get advanced airway management, there seems to be an advantage, but that could be bias. And interestingly, in this study, as in other studies, we also see a, and a signal in here which tells us that actually advanced airway management of any type does not seem to uh, be associated with a better outcome. Uh, that's it. Thank you.
Jonathan, thank you for that. Without any further ado, I'm going to move on to our next speaker, who's Henry Wang. Henry was the principal investigator for the um, Pragmatic Airway Resuscitation Trial, the PART trial. And Henry has come just a short distance from the United States. Henry. Good afternoon. Thank you for this opportunity to share the results of our Pragmatic Airway Resuscitation Trial. Uh, I would like to share results that help will reinforce the impressive findings of the Airways 2 trial. And uh, let me offer that our complementary study has a simple design with a simple result. I'd like to thank my partners from the Resuscitation Outcomes Consortium. They not only made the study possible, but have been my faithful supporters for the last 10 years in bringing this trial to fruition. The study was supported by an NIH grant from the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. The AMBU Corporation provided replacement laryngeal tubes for the airways they had uh, for the trial. They had no role in the design, execution, or analysis of the trial. In the United States, endotracheal intubation is the most common advanced airway technique used by paramedics in the treatment of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. Intubation is the main event of resuscitation. We call it the showstopper. It's the procedure that defines advanced life support paramedic care in the US. 30 years ago, we integrated intubation into paramedic care under the assumption that by mirroring in-hospital practices, we would uh, improve out-of-hospital cardiac arrest outcomes. However, a range of studies over the last 10 years have highlighted the difficulty of intubation including uh, its pitfalls, including multiple attempts, its interruptions uh, of chest compressions, as well as the fact that we, are, we struggle to provide adequate training and clinical experience in intubation for our paramedics. In the United States, some paramedic students graduate from training without having performed a single live intubation. And in many of our communities, paramedics have the opportunity to intubate only once per year. Superglottic airway devices, the newer generation devices, offer an appealing alternative to intubation. They have simpler technique, require less training, provide similar ventilation, and we are beginning to see its increasing use as the primary out airway in out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. But when you examine observational data uh, comparing superglottic airways with intubation, you have an unexpected finding. That is, it appears that intubation seems to fare better, result in higher survival and better outcomes than superglottic airways in these observational studies. Okay. Until now, there have been no randomized controlled trials directly comparing superglottic airways with intubation in the out-of-hospital setting. And so the objective of our study, the Pragmatic Airway Resuscitation Trial, or PART, was to compare the effectiveness of a strategy of initial laryngeal tube insertion versus a strategy of initial intubation upon outcomes in a out of hospital cardiac arrest. We conducted a multi-center cluster randomized trial with crossover involving select communities from the uh, US Resuscitation Outcomes Consortium. We conducted the trial using 27 EMS agencies from these communities. We conducted the trial using US exception from informed consent rules. There are parameters of the grant award that influenced the design of the study. First of all, the study was for pragmatic clinical trials, and hence we decided from the get-go in designing the study that all the trial interventions had to reflect real-world practices. And therefore, we were going to use standard uh, um, uh, clinical procedures defined by each paramedic agency. We, we, we would be focusing on outcomes. There would be less emphasis on mechanistic aspects of this relationship. EMS agencies would use their existing uh, training pro programs for airway management. Uh, the amount of the funding was only $2.3 uh, $2 million uh, in US funds, and that constrained our ability to examine more definitive outcomes. And finally, the trial included US sites only because some fine print in the RFA limited the grant to US sites only, and we had to exclude our Canadian partners. These were the inclusion criteria for the study. Simply put, we included all adult out-of-hospital cardiac arrests that require advanced airway or back valve mass ventilation. This chart provides an overview of the interventions. Patients were cluster, uh, sorry, EMS agencies were cluster randomized to periods of 
intubation first as the airway management technique or laryngeal tube first as the airway management technique. There are select basic level um, EMS providers that are trained in the laryngeal tube uh, insertion. And as you can see, we integrated those units into the protocol. This chart depicts the cluster crossover patterns used in the trial. EMS agencies uh, were assigned to alternate between the interventions at three to five month intervals. Okay. The EMS agencies were organized into 13 randomization clusters. The primary outcome of the study was 72 hours survival, and this is necessary due to the limited grant funding. Um, and we also wanted to account for the fact that therapeutic hypothermia and early coronary interventions could be part of the initial care of post-cardiac arrest patients. Okay. Secondary outcomes included more traditional outcomes such as survival to hospital discharge, favorable neurologic outcome on hospital discharge, and airway management uh, uh, adverse events. We analyzed the data using intention to treat principles. We powered the study to detect a 4.5% difference in 72 hours survival, aiming for a total enrollment of 3,000 subjects. We enrolled a total of 3,004 patients in the study with 1,505 assigned to initial laryngeal tube and 1,499 assigned to initial endotracheal intubation. Patient characteristics were similar between the laryngeal tube and the intubation groups. Protocol compliance was over 90% for both arms of the study. An interesting finding was that in the intubation first strategy, the intubation success rate was only about 51%. However, overall airway success was over 90% in both arms. Time to airway initiation and placement were over two and a half minutes faster in the laryngeal tube than the intubation group. And of note, a portion of all airways in both groups were converted to intubation when upon patient arrival in the emergency department. This table summarizes the primary outcomes of the study. Laryngeal tube resulted in an almost 3% higher 72 hour survival than the initial intubation group. This difference persisted to the more definitive endpoints associated with cardiac arrests, including survival to hospital discharge and survival with favorable neurologic outcome. And this is a force plot summarizing the similar, same results in graphical format. Other important sub-analyses, the per protocol analysis, retaining only those that uh, where the uh, intervention, the patient was compliant with the assigned intervention, showed a similar benefit for laryngeal tube. There were some post hoc adjusted analyses that attenuated some of the survival differences seen between the groups. Um, these uh, analyses persisted for both uh, post hoc per protocol as well as as treated analyses. And this table summarizes some of the adverse events. There were some higher rates of multiple attempts and airway failure in the intubation group. There was a slightly higher rate of inadequate ventilation in the laryngeal tube group. Among hospital adverse events, there were small differences, uh, but clinically negligible differences between the laryngeal tube and, and intubation arms. So in summary, our study suggests better out-of-hospital cardiac arrest outcomes with a strategy of initial laryngeal tube uh, than a strategy of initial endo endotracheal intubation. And while we designed the trial to study 72-hour survival, we observed associations with laryngeal tube insertion that persisted to more definitive endpoints, including hospital survival and favorable neurologic outcome. A lot of discussion has circulated around the 51% intubation success rate observed in the initial intubation um, arm of the study. Our study team was not surprised by this finding. A common practice in the United States is to advocate limited numbers of intubation attempts with early um, uh, changeover to rescue airway management using a laryngeal tube or other supraglottic airway technique. And we believe that this was the prevalent culture among the EMS agencies uh, in uh, participating in this trial. 
Our observation is affirmed by the complementary finding that overall airway success, failed intubation plus rescue with supraglottic airways, was over 92% in the intubation arm. We do not know if the trial results would be different with an agency with different intubating performance characteristics. So in conclusion, in this trial, we found that a strategy of initial laryngeal tube insertion was associated with better out-of-hospital cardiac arrest outcomes than a strategy of initial endotracheal intubation. EMS providers may consider initial laryngeal tube insertion as the primary advanced airway management strategy in the resuscitation of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. Thank you very much. Thank you, Henry. A very clear delivery of, a, again, quite a complex trial. So our, our, our third study that's going to be presented to you, actually, we've just appreciated this has been done kind of slightly in the wrong order, really, because the CAM trial was actually the first of the three trials to be published, and also is the one that involves, I guess, uh, an assessment of the most basic management, airway management technique. We're very um, uh, pleased to have Stefano Malinverni, who's one of the investigators of that trial, who's going to talk to us about the CAM study. Stefano. Thank you very much for the invitation, first of all. And then I would like to apologize, Professor Adne, which was the principal investigator of this trial, who could not be present today. And I have to thank all the participants to the trial. Of course, many of those are present here in the audience. So I'm going to present this paper, which has been published on the JAMA on February, which talks about the effect of back mask ventilations versus endotracheal intubation during CPR for out-of-hospital cardiac arrest and focusing on neurological outcome at 28 days. And all the words in the title are quite important to understand the, the trial. I have no conflict of interest to disclose. And for those who like to take photos of the slides, please take a photo of this one. I would be happy to share all my slides, but please do not take any photos. It's quite distracting afterwards. So to understand the trial, we first have to understand what was the evidence before the study, because this evidence influenced clearly the design of the study. And the evidence before the CAM trial and before the beautiful trials we just saw was coming mainly from retrospective observational trial that are exposed to clearly some bias. Nevertheless, one of these trials, for instance, the Osagawa trial published in JAMA in 2013, was clearly showing that there was an increase in survival with good neurological outcome for back mass ventilation compared to endotracheal tube. For each patient having a favorable outcome in terms of neurological outcome at 28 days, you had three patients almost having a favorable outcome in the back mass ventilation. And same sort of results were found by the FUSH, um, by the FUSH paper as well. So what was our research question? Our research question was, is back mass ventilation non-inferior, and actually this is a quite important word, to an endotracheal intubation for advanced airway management during out-of-hospital cardiac arrest with regard to favorable neurological function at 28 days. So the study design, I will not go into detail because I have only 10 minutes, but it was a randomized parallel group non-inferiority trial involving two countries, and it was multicenter, of course. So to go quickly through it, so it was randomized, and actually the strength of this trial is that was, it was randomized at the patient bed, at the point of care. There was an open envelope that was open at the moment of the rest after the exclusion criteria were controlled, and patients were randomized uh, one patient by one. Randomization was stratified by center. This allowed balanced distribution across treatment groups at any time at any center. It was a non-inferiority trial, so we were not trying to show whether it was a superiority. We were trying to prove that actually back mask ventilation was known inferior to endotracheal intubation. As the evidence before the study, as I show you, 
it was pointing towards a superiority. This was not a very ambitious trial at the beginning. Then we will see what was the results. Sample size calculation was based, of course, on previous literature, and we were expecting 3% good neurological outcome for patients with back, map, back valve mask ventilation and 2% good percent outcome for patients randomized to endotracheal intubation. And we set a lower limit for the confidence interval to be at 1%, and this is quite important, as it will come afterwards. So it's important as well to understand in the study design, as has been pointed before, in which context we're working in. And so in France and Belgium, which, was the, which were the two countries participating to this trial, actually the system is a two-tiered EMS system involving a trained e emergency physician on the spot, either an emergency physician or either an anesthetist. So it means that in this trial, you had a doctor at the side of your patient. Recruitment went as expected. We enrolled the number of patients we wanted at the pace we wanted to allow our 80% power to demonstrate non-inferiority. Which, which are the results? So first of all, you can see that we had quite well-balanced group. I say quite well-balanced group because in terms of age, there was a statistical significant difference between the two groups having younger patients in the endotracheal intubation group but the statistical significant difference was two years in terms of absolute difference. So you might wonder whether it's really clinically relevant. And there was a significant difference between the two groups in terms of history of psychiatric disorders. Nevertheless, if we go through the, the two groups, we see that roughly 70% had bystander witness cardiac arrest and that bystander initiated CPR was roughly 50%. If you go at the initial cardiac rhythm to have an idea of which kind of patient are we speaking about, roughly 15, 16% of the patient have a shockable rhythm at the beginning. And just to finish to describe our patients, the time from collapse to the initiation of an advanced life support was in median 20%. So our intervention, the randomization, happened at 20 minutes after the initial call. So what are the results? Concerning the primary outcome, which was a good neurological outcome defined as CPC class one or two, there was no difference in terms of good neurological outcome. As you can see, you had 4.3% of good neurological outcome for back mask ventilation and 4.2% difference for endotracheal intubation. This led to an absolute difference of 0.1 and a one-sided confidence interval of minus 1.64, which led to a P of 0.11 for non-inferiority. I'm not a big fan of statistics, but to really understand the conclusion of the trial, I think it's good to go through this slide, which shows you what it means to show superiority, non-inferiority, or when non-inferiority is not shown. So the first line on the top of the slide shows superiority. When your point estimate is above the zero and both confidence intervals are not hitting the zero line. Non-inferiority can be shown as long as your point estimate is somewhere around the zero, but the lower confidence of interval is not hitting the lower limit you you set, and in our uh, study, this lower limit was, some, was uh, decided to be minus 1%. So our trial is actually looks like the fifth line on this slide, starting counting from the upper part. We had a point estimate of 0 0.11, but our lower confidence interval was at minus 1.64, so it was below the lower um, threshold we have decided in the design of the study. So non-inferiority was not demonstrated. We had some secondary analysis that were predefined before the beginning of the study, and it was to look, first of all, of course, to uh, ROSC. Okay, as expected, as there was some evidence before, 
there was a l slightly higher uh, rate of ROSC uh, into the ATI group, and this was, significant, uh, was statistically significant with a roughly 4% higher ROSC in the ATI group. This did not lead to a higher survival to hospital admission. There was a trend, but there was no significant difference, and this did not lead to a higher survival at 28 days. And as we saw before, there was no difference in terms of CPCs. Other secondary outcomes that we looked into, it was of course um, outcomes related to difficulties in the ventilation, and we saw that the rate of airway management difficulties was actually higher in the back mass ventilation group. This rate was significantly higher, and it was roughly 4%. We had a higher rate of failures as well um, in the back mass ventilation group, and it was roughly thrice as much as in the endotracheal intubation group. And finally, uh, we had a higher, a well significantly higher um, rate of regurgitation of gastric content uh, in the back mass ventilation group. So back mass ventilation was leading to a higher, um, significantly higher difficulties, failure, and regurgitation. There was a postdoc analysis on a single center, center number five, um, that collected data on chest compression fraction throughout the intervention. And these are quite interesting data because I've been grown listening that endotracheal uh, intubation increases uh, chest compression fraction. Actually looking at the whole intervention, so starting from the moment that we were at the bedside of the patient until the very end of the intervention, we could not show any difference in terms of chest compression fraction related to the utilization of one or the other technique in terms of advanced airway management. So both cases, we had 86% chest compression fraction for back mass ventilation and 87% in the endotracheal uh, tube uh, group. We had a higher number of pauses longer than two seconds in the back mass ventilation group, and this was clearly related to the technique we were using. So in conclusion, unfortunately, our trial is an inconclusive trial. Non-inferiority of back mass ventilation compared to endotracheal intubation was not demonstrated. As a secondary outcome, and which has to be considered as exploratory, it's not what was the, uh, the trial was not designed to show these um, outcomes. We had a higher uh, rate of ROSC in patients that were treated with an endotracheal tube. We have a significant lower airway difficulties, failure or regurgitation with an endotracheal tube. And actually we saw that endotracheal tube does not increase chest compression fraction. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stefano, and thank you to all three speakers, because we've got now sufficient time for a panel discussion. Can I invite the panel members to uh, come up to the podium, please? We should have probably about eight or nine of you, I believe. And we're going to stick to the same format as the first half of this session. So I will get, once they've seated themselves, the panel members to make some brief comments. And I think we should have about two minutes for each of you. So, reasonable amount of time. I've got to see, I think it must be Kylie, Ky it's Kylie at this end, is it? Yeah, and then Rude. It's difficult for me to see over here. Okay. And then, Andy, you're still collecting the Twitter feed, are you? So we'll try and give you time to feed back on that. So, thoughts from the panel? A couple of minutes each, starting with Kylie. Thank you so much. Uh, congratulations. Can we get the mic on over there? Think you're on. Congratulations to all of you. Um, all of these studies are incredibly impressive. Uh, well done on pulling it off, recruiting so many patients. Um, the first thing that comes to mind after hearing these studies and reading the articles is that it's hard to justify using intubation as a first-line strategy 
to treat cardiac arrest. Given that there is potential that you're causing harm for the patient in terms of survival, but also um, the paramedics are less likely to use the intubation, they're more likely to transfer to something else, um, they're less likely to successfully ventilate the patient, and it seems as though, uh, in terms of comparing SGA and intubation, um, regurgitation and aspiration might not be as big of an issue as we previously thought. Um, so it's hard to justify using intubation as a first-line strategy. But also, um, these studies indicate that perhaps um, airway management might not actually have that much of an impact on out-of-hospital cardiac arrest survival. So um, if we were to focus our efforts you know, in the dispatch centre or in, in bystander CPR or defibrillation or really effective paramedic defibrillation and CPR, then perhaps that's really where the money is. And the risk with intubation is, of course, that um, given that it is a difficult skill that takes paramedics a long time, um, perhaps then the intubation is actually interfering with those skills, the defibrillation and the high quality CPR, and um, perhaps then that is causing the patient harm through distracting the paramedics from the interventions that we know actually uh, improve survival. So they're my thoughts. Thanks very much indeed, Kylie. And I think it's Rudy Costa next. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to start and join everybody else who will certainly also say the same thing, that these are three beautiful trials and extremely important. But given together, they didn't solve all my questions. Um, we have half the time to study three times as many studies as the previous group of discussants. I'll bring out three very short issues. The first, and it has already been very beautifully demonstrated now by, by Dr. Mariverni, who produced the last one, a non-inferiority study is not the same as a superiority study. The Airways 2 trial is designed and executed as a superiority trial, and superiority is not demonstrated. But this does not imply <coughs> that if superiority is not demonstrated, that identity is therefore proven. We cannot conclude from the lack of superiority in the Airways 2 trial that both treatments are equal. And in fact, if you look at the forest plot, as shown in the paper, uh, later in the paper, you can see that even for the, pri for the primary outcome and for many others as well, there's at least a 20% left over chance of the uh, outcome that endotracheal intubation is the better treatment. It's not shown, but the non-inferiority assumption is, makes that still possible. So that's my first comment. The second comment is that, and that's also shown, but it's important to know, that, mask, that bag mask valve treatment is difficult. It, the fact that there is so much technical difficulty in carrying it out needs us to con still consider that any of the advanced airways should maybe still be there, also knowing that all, none of these trials are really conclusive on the level of survival to discharge with neurological outcome. The third one is that it's not in the trials, but we should be careful. Um, superglottal airways, whatever type, are um, are, are advanced airways. And the guidelines so far will say that as soon as a patient has been treated with an advanced airways, the relationship between chest compression and ventilation should switch to uninterrupted asynchronous compressions and ventilations. We should stay aware that with asynchronous compressions and ventilations, there may be moments of exceedingly high interthoracic pressure and the safe leakage-free that uh, connection that is usually accomplished with endotracheal intubation may not be as, uh, as adequate in superglottal airways. I'm not saying that we should not do it, but we should say be more careful, and we need probably studies to more better investigate the leakage value of uh, superglottal airways when uh, intrathoracic uh, pressures are very high. Thank you, Rudy. Charles Deakin. Thanks, Jerry. 
Well, uh, as others have said, I just wanted to start off congratulating all the authors and, and, and their research teams for some fantastic studies. I mean, certainly the way the resuscitation guidelines are going is that they are being driven by randomized studies and, uh, uh, of the quality that we've seen. And so there's an even greater need for these studies than there ever has been because certainly those of you who are involved in the actual construction of the guidelines will understand that anything less than a randomized prospective study is really given so little weight that it, it doesn't contribute a great deal to the guidelines. So everyone's research efforts should certainly be focused on studies of these qualities in terms of driving forward our understanding of optimal care. Um, in, in, the thing that struck me with these three studies is that they more or less came to the same conclusion that tracheal intubation is not the savior that we, we have sort of been thinking it has been. Um, and you know, we've, we've heard various excuses as to why tracheal intubation may be possibly beneficial. I, I remain to be convinced personally. But I mean, the, the, the basic premise of medical treatment is first do no harm. And um, I've seen nothing in any of these studies to support really the routine use of tracheal intubation. Um, I, I think it probably does have um, uh, uh, indications in some circumstances, but I, th I think my concern is the, if you get tracheal intubation wrong in terms of uh, the time it takes to secure the airway or the, the, the possible significant morbidity from it, endobronchial intubation, unrecognized esophageal intubation, um, the, 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 any benefits from it may well be negated by the possible harm that it causes, particularly when, when many people who are uh, um, doing endotracheal intubation haven't had a great deal of skills and practice um, in terms of the pre-hospital delivery. So in terms of the pre-hospital management of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, um, I think supraglottic airways are here to stay and, and, and probably to be used um, uh, more so than perhaps we've, we've seen. And, and tracheal intubation, I think based on the results we've seen, should be reserved for perhaps specific indications. Um, but the thing that strikes me, both from the airway studies that we've seen uh, now and also um, Gavin's paramedic to adrenaline study is that all these advanced life support interventions are, 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 are very depressing in terms of the, the lack of um, improvement in outcome that, that they bring. And that, that we, we, we've, we've known that for some time. There have been suggestions that ALS isn't all that it's been made out to be since mm -hmm. Ian Steele's OPAL study sort of 15 years ago, um, which failed to show any difference between BLS and ALS outcome. And, and we're, we're sort of confirming what Ian found 15 years ago. Um, so, my view, I, rather, I just wonder whether investing all this money in advanced life support, we ought to be investing it in teaching school children um, uh, good basic life support, improving public access defibrillation networks, um, and concentrating on things that we know make a big difference to people in terms of outcome. I mean, public access defibrillation, if someone can defibrillate you, uh, you've got a two to three-fold increase in chances of survival. That's orders of magnitude more than the subtle differences that we can argue about from these studies. So I think possibly as a resuscitation community, I'm not saying that we shouldn't be studying these sort of things, but, but there needs to be a lot more emphasis on those early rings in the chain of survival. Okay, thanks, Charles. Thank Marek Castron. Thank you for very nice presentations, and I'm sure that you all had had a lot of pain and misery, like Jonathan said, uh, during these uh, trials. So thank you for taking all that. Um, as my colleague said, I think it's uh, one of the things is that it's limited training and, and limited clinical experience, like one of the slides said, that it's one of the issues. And like Charles said, what if what if we would have a different training? I don't know how many paramedics actually train uh, like hundreds of intubations a year, or if they do the one a year, as was told in the, in the uh, slides, that would that make a difference if we would be very good at something that we do, or do we really have to try to find something that I have shown that the conscript can learn in 20 seconds by looking at the mobile video, putting in a laryngeal tube? That is still, I think, one of the questions. And as, as a dispatcher fan, I agree with Charles that we should focus maybe efforts on the, on the start of all of this. One thing that was very, very interesting and um, comes because I'm very like, interested in ethics is Jonathan told us that it's unethical to randomize uh, standing by a cardiac arrest patient. And a couple of uh, 
minutes later, Stefano tells us that that's the absolute strength of their study, that they randomize standing by the patient. And I think this, we really, I, I have never been in a discussion where we actually talk about what we can do when we have a cardiac arrest patient to make a good study and what we shouldn't do to kind of harm the patient when we do the studies. And I know that EU is really kind of making it very difficult now. And I think that we could talk about that in one of our meetings too. Okay, thanks, Marat. I will just make just one comment to that because I know Jonathan probably can't respond. I don't think his comment was it was unethical to randomize the paramedics in the airways too. Um, it was just the practicality of being able to do that. There are limitations. And I should declare my COI as a co-investigator. Yeah, and, it, and there are delay that causes delay, etc. And clearly the CAM trial were able to do that and congratulations to them, but it's challenging. Um, so we've got just about five minutes now. So Bernd Bottegar. Thank you very much. First of all, cordial congratulations to all investigators. These studies are great and are very important. And I fully agree that one of the future visions we should have is we need to invest in school children education, CPR, which is probably extremely more effective than doing epinephrine versus placebo or something like this. That's, that's coming from my heart. And the next statement is, if you are comparing one technique with another technique, you need to be 100% sure that the, the paramedics or the doctors who are doing both are 100% effective with this technique. And if you have a first pass success rate for endotracheal intubation, and we know the first pass success is key, not only in cardiac arrest patients, but also in trauma patients in the OR, if this rate is only 50% in one study and maybe 78% in another study, that is not a success rate uh, speaking to, um, to a very professional dealing with a high complex procedure. Endotracheal intubation is a high complex procedure. And it is totally easy to, in, to install an IGL or lar laryngeal mask. And if you have a system where you are not trained enough for one technique, you should probably better use the other technique. I would like to give you an example. For example, if you compare in patients with acute myocardial infarction, the use of beta blockers and the use of acute coronary intervention in the PCI lab. And if you have people not enough trained in doing coronary uh, angioplasty in the PCI lab, the beta blocker will be superior. So first is you need to ensure that a technique is 100% effectively performed. And if this is not the fact, in your system, uh, another technique may be superior, although the other one is the better one. So that is one of my statements. And I'm, I, I need to repeat, I'm coming from a country where we have, hopefully still, the right, the patient has the right to have a doctor within eight minutes to ten minutes in my country, and 70 percent of these doctors coming to the patient are anesthesiologists at least trained for two, three, four years. And these guys are doing endotracheal intubation 10 times a day during their daily routine work. And in such a system, the results would have probably been totally different. So it, it depends on whether you are successful with a technique and the last study clearly shows that the most important thing is oxygenation, not intubation or something like this. If you are able to oxygenate the patient regardless with what technique, but you need to be very skilled with the technique, then the patient can survive. Okay. Thanks, Boone. Pierre Colley. Thank you, Jerry. I'm the last. So everything I've said before. <laughs> anyway, first point, we have to save the brain, not the ventilation and not the circulation. So the aim is to focus on the brain pronosis, defibrillation, cardiac massage, and so on. And that's really an important point. Second point, you've seen one EMS, you've seen one EMS. In your system, you have to be the best for the best result for the brain. 
but this does not mean it will work in another place. Anyway, for ventilation and airway control, bag mask seems to be simple. It is not. It may be dangerous and it needs skills and it's difficult to perform and you may overventilate the patient on scene. So we have to do something for the airway. In that case, if you have physician like Byrne and myself we have in MICU and that physician are working part-time in the ER, part-time in the OR or, resuscita or uh, intensive care units, they do intubation. And there is nothing in the study that we have seen that says yes, don't do that, it's dangerous. For example, like volume loading in a bleeding patient without hemostasis, it's not the case. Inferiority, not superiority, exactly the purpose. Then, if you don't want to train people like that, who don't, you don't have trained people like that in your system, you use supraglottic, and we have seen that it works and it gives good results, and you must invest on supraglottic, train people to do that, and have the best result as you can. Thanks, Pierre. Very good comments. So very good comments from all of the panel, a very wide range of comments. Um, Andy Lockie, who's controlling our Twitter feed. Any other additional comments? We've got a mic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jerry. Once again, a lot of love from the audience for the uh, presentations and also for the panelists as well. And uh, wonderfully, and su not surprisingly, for Charles Deakin. You, <laughs> you, you seem to have a lot of, lot of people who love you out there. So that's nice. Um, can I just add one small caveat to the comment that you made um, with a conflict of interest declared? Although the components of ALS may not be shown to be beneficial, there is some evidence that suggests that attendance on an ALS course uh, actually brings better patient outcomes. So we should not cut the funding to ALS courses totally. <laughs> Although, <laughs> and my conflict of interest is that I wrote that system in a systematic review. Um, although, fully agree with you, bystander CPR and public access awareness, uh, uh, AD awareness is vital. Um, yes, lots of people loving the presentations and a few people who are going away to change their practice as a result of today. Andy, thanks for that. Um, and it really just leaves me to conclude this session with a short summary, I think. We, so you've heard four really high quality randomized control trials. I suspect it'll be very difficult when we've got another session later on, but it's pretty hard to get so many high quality RCTs together at one resuscitation meeting. So a bit of a unique event. I think, and it's been said before, that each and every one of these studies have probably raised more questions than they've absolutely answered. And I think we all need to go away and think very hard about the implications of the results. I know that the various task forces in ILCOR will be discussing those. So the ultimate answer to the question, how is this going to change the guidelines and affect our practice, may not be known for some time to come. So don't hold your breath yet, um, but we'll get there in the end. So thank you to all of the speakers, thank you to my co-chair, and thank you to all the panelists. And for those of you going to the social event this evening, I hope you enjoy that, and we look forward to seeing you both there and to the Congress tomorrow. Thank you very much indeed.